Hey. Hi, Mike. Happy Advent. Thank you, and you too. Well, thank you. Did you eat too much at Thanksgiving? I did, actually. <laughs> So but it was I. good. <laughs> I'd do good, it again. It? All right. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Oh. Hey, well, again, welcome. We are so glad to have you here this morning. And those of you joining us on live stream, this is really the kickoff of our Advent season here at SRPC as we anticipate the birth of Jesus coming into our world and into our midst once again. You know, every year it can be new and fresh as Jesus comes to us in, in unique and different ways in terms of uh, our life circumstances. You know, um, I was at the tree lighting a couple of nights ago in downtown Danville, big tradition for the town of Danville. And I loved being there for a lot of different reasons, but one of the really cool things is to see reunions that happen. To see kids in particular that are coming home from college, seeing each other again, to see people who haven't seen one another in a long time, and there we all are at the old oak tree in downtown Danville. There is a sense of, of rightness about being home for the holidays. And I hope that that is your experience here this season at SRPC. That in many ways you are feeling home again for the holidays whether online or in person, but we hope really in person that this would be a place of familiarity, it'd be a place of comfort, it'd be a place of love for you and for your family at Christmas time. And so we want to create a welcoming environment for all of us this Christmas season. As I said at the outset, we're beginning a series now that'll take us all the way through Christmas called Real Christmas, R-E-E-L, the reason we're calling it Real Christmas that way is we're taking a look at movie scenes from Christmas movies, movies that have a message. You know, the best Christmas movies always have a way of connecting with the timeless message of the gospel, of helping us lean into a, a truth about who God is and what God has done in the person of Jesus. And today we're taking a look at, at the theme of hopes and dreams. I would imagine that as we anticipate Christmas, we all have a sense of hope. And hope looks different for different people. It looks different at various stages of life too, doesn't it? For instance, when we were kids, and for some of us, myself including, that was a long time ago, when we were kids, we have childhood memories perhaps of hopes that we had at Christmas of a Christmas list that we put together, of maybe giving something to Santa or an elf or mailing off a letter and hoping that the thing we've asked for will come at Christmas. How many of you remember hoping for something at Christmas? Would you just slip up your hand? Yeah, we all do. Isn't it great when it comes? For many of us, that hope got fulfilled, that childhood hope got fulfilled at Christmas. Now, I want to say this, that hopes don't go away. They just change. As we grow up, we have different hopes. Hopes that are bigger, hopes that are more complex, hopes that maybe even seem more distant from us. We, we have a picture of what we want life to be. We have a picture of what we maybe want Christmas to be this year, and we will work hard to make that picture, to make that Christmas, to make that hope happen. Those are adult-sized hopes, and, and most of us have, have the, the tenacity to do everything that we can to pull it off. Now, here's what I know about me, and I, I think I know it about you. When our hopes for Christmas are at risk, we will do whatever it takes. When our hopes and dreams for Christmas are at risk, we will do whatever it takes, won't we? Oh, hi, SRPC live streamers. Thanks so much for being with us today. Hey, I want you to know that one of our family favorite movies is called Christmas with the Cranks. It's the story of Luther and Nora Crank who have an only child named Blair. And just before the holiday season, Blair announces to them that she's gonna join the Peace Corps and move to Peru. So all the family Christmas traditions are going down the tubes for Christmas. Well, you can imagine the despair, and in the midst of it all, Luther comes up with this crazy and kind of brilliant idea. 
rather than wallowing in the depths of despair during the holiday season, he decides that he and Nora ought to take a tropical cruise over Christmas. Well, they go all in with this cruise idea, and Luther decides that the best way to do this, the best way to totally commit, is to actually skip Christmas. What that means for them is that means no presents, no Christmas cards, no decorations, no tree, no gifts, nothing. They're boycotting, they're skipping Christmas. Well, in the process of doing that, they offend almost everybody. They offend their friends, they offend offend their neighbors, they offend their coworkers. And yet they're committed to this cruise. So they're literally packing the day before the cruise and the phone rings. It's their daughter, Blair, and she announces that she's coming home for Christmas. She's going to surprise them and she's coming home for Christmas. Well, all bets are off as Nora goes into full on, we got to make this right mode. And she begins to devise a plan within 24 hours to pull off the Christmas that their daughter, Blair, knows and loves. So immediately, Nora is tasked with going to the store and putting together all the food for the Christmas dinner. She ends up at a grocery store looking for a ham, which is Blair's favorite food at Christmas. Well, there's only one ham left in the store, and on the way to the display, she's racing with another customer. She gets cut off by a cart and ends up crashing into a cookie display. And at that moment, this customer that she's chase or running with ends up with that ham. Well, totally dejected, Nora is leaving the store when she spots another family with a ham at the checkout stand. It happens to be a young family and Nora walks up and just offers to buy the ham. They think she's crazy and yet Nora decides that the best thing to do is to bribe them for it. And she ends up writing a pretty substantial check to start this little toddler's college education fund. Well, Nora's on cloud nine as she's leaving the store, but she's jostled by some other Christmas shoppers and the ham ends up rolling into the street and being run over by a semi. And Nora's left screaming as this ham is shattered in the road and so are her Christmas plans. Well, Luther, on the other hand, is tasked with giving a treat, getting a tree, and he's offended everybody, including the scouts who tried to sell him one just a couple of weeks earlier. So Luther has to end up bribing a neighbor to borrow their tree while they're out of town visiting family. Luther loads the tree up onto a a wagon, and on the way down the driveway and across the street to his house, the tree tips over and falls into the streets, breaking all of the ornaments. Just at that moment, A police car comes by, they're patrolling the neighborhood, and the policemen get out, and of course, he's offended them by not giving to the Christmas police fundraiser. Well, his life and his future is in jeopardy, too, because the police aren't going to show him any mercy. When finally he's given a little bit of grace by the young boy who was helping him and said, you know, it's all okay, and he had permission to borrow the tree. Well, The story ends where nothing goes right putting this Christmas uh, Day celebration together. And if it weren't for the commitment of neighbors who find out their plight, the Cranks would have had a miserable and disappointing Christmas for Blair. You know, it just goes to show that when our Christmas plans, when our hopes, when our dreams are in jeopardy, we will do just about anything to make it happen. I know that we have hopes at Christmas that may be in jeopardy right now, and yet we're going to find out how the first Christmas story really addressed those hopes and how to meet them. So there's just a little teaser about that movie. I hope you have the chance to enjoy that movie at Christmas time. It's it's a fun one. It's a family favorite at our house. But the truth is there. When our hopes for Christmas are at risk, We will do whatever it takes to make it happen. Well, do you realize that the first Christmas came in the midst of hopes that had been crushed? You do remember that, don't you? Think of Mary and Joseph. Mary was betrothed and she was planning her wedding. She was planning her new life filled with hopes and dreams. When the angel appears to Mary, 
and flips the script on her. I want to take you to Luke chapter 1, and we'll read that encounter once again that Mary has with the angel. This is how we read it in Luke 1, beginning with verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In an instant, Mary's life changes. She goes from this hopeful future to a future of shame. She goes from an anticipated hopeful future to a future where she has a high potential of being abandoned in that culture and possibly even being put to death. Her script got flipped. Her hopes, the ones that she was anticipating, were crushed. Then there's Joseph. Joseph had hopes too. He had a career going. He had a bride-to-be coming into his life. He had a family, a life to anticipate. His life plan was in motion. And yet, an angel comes to him in a dream. And I want to take you to Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. And let's read Joseph's part of the story. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together... She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So we realize that the first Christmas came in the midst of hopes for this young couple that had been completely turned upside down. Hopes, you might say, that had been crushed. And that truth gives us permission to be real, at Christmas. You see, we don't have to pretend. We don't have to fake it at Christmas when it comes to hopes that are not happening. Christmas is about Jesus coming into the world of real people with real problems. He still does. Jesus comes into the real world of health problems. Jesus comes into the real world of loneliness and of wayward children and of anxiety, and oppression, and depression, and addiction. Jesus comes into that real world. He did then, and he did now. Just like the first Christmas, hope this Christmas comes in the middle of real life. Sometimes comes in the middle of a mess. Mary and Joseph each did something that helped them hang on to hope, that kept hope alive. And I want to point that out today. That's that's where we're aiming in the message today. What did Mary do? What did Joseph do to keep hope alive? Let's take a look at Mary first. In Luke chapter 1, verse 38, there's one single verse that really tips us off to what Mary did. i put it on the screen for you, and let me read it for us. Mary said, I am the Lord's servant, May your word to me be fulfilled. I am the Lord's servant. 
may your word to be be fulfilled. You see, instead of taking matters into her own hands, instead of doing whatever it takes to make it work out the way Mary wanted, Mary had a posture of openness. Here's what I know, and this may be the most important thing that you take away this morning. God will not compete with you for control of your life. I think I need to say that again. God will not compete with you for control of your life. God waits. Now, I don't know about you, but instinctively, when things aren't going the way I want them to, I will do everything that I can, everything in my power to take control, to make it happen, to get the results I want. And the truth of God's word is that God will not compete with me or with you or with anyone for control of your life. That's what freedom is all about. God instead waits. What is God waiting for? He's waiting for a posture of openness. He's waiting for relinquishment. He's waiting for us to say in our own way, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. See, deep, sustaining hope always begins with an openness to God. Last week, we had our sharing here in the sanctuary in Thanksgiving, and several people popped up and, and shared. I was so moved. There were so many things that were powerfully shared. But I remember Judy Whitham standing right over there, and Judy was diagnosed a year and a half ago with stage four lung cancer. She stands up, and this is what Judy says. She says, I can't explain the peace that I have. How does that work? Dick Sanner stood right over here and he, he shared about his life journey, including this past year, just several months ago, he and his wife Linda lost their son, Sean, to a battle with cancer. And Dick stands here and he says this, I, I know that God will never leave us or forsake us. How does that work? How does that happen? Judy and her husband, Ken, and Dick and his wife, Linda, are testimonies to a posture of openness. And God is giving them hope. God is giving them peace one day at a time because they have a posture of openness. Where are you tempted right now to grab control of your life? God will not compete with that. Instead, God waits. God waits for a posture of openness. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. I've been trying new things in my life when it comes to prayer. Remember, if you grew up in church or know about church, you know as a kid you were taught to fold your hands and close your eyes and bow your head. And that's how you pray. I don't know, I've done that forever. And, and I just realized, this is me, it may not be you, but I just realized this is such a closed posture. And I know it's meant to focus us on God, but everything about this physically says that I am shut down and I'm holding tight to my world. And so I begun to pray like this. Just hands in my lap, open, with my head up and my eyes closed. It's a posture of openness. See, I think that's what God is waiting for in all of our lives so hope can enter in. <laughs> that's Mary. Then there's Joseph. How, how did Joseph hold on to the hope in the middle of all that was going wrong in his life? Here's the verse we can lock into. Matthew 1, 24. We'll put it up on the screen. 20 and then 24. Joseph, son of David, this is the angel talking to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Then what happens in verse 24? When Joseph woke up, 
he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. Now think about that for just a moment. Joseph's plan for his life went completely off the rails, but Joseph took the next step of trust, just one step. He did what the angel said and took Mary as his wife. It was a lonely next step. It was a a publicly embarrassing next step, but it paved the way for the birth of Jesus. You see, hope comes one next step at a time. The most courageous decision you'll ever make is to trust God when your plans are not working out. Did you know that? (laughs) The most courageous decision that you will ever make is to trust God when your plans are not working out. Some of us here today and on live stream have a step that we know we need to take. We need to make a phone call. We just, we do. We need to admit an addiction. It's time. We need to offer an I'm sorry to someone. The keys to hope this Christmas are taking one step, trusting God with that one step when your plans aren't working out. So as we close today, let me just ask this simple question. Where do you need hope this Christmas? God, I need hope here. Where is that? The two most important people in the Christmas story were people that were desperate for hope. And that's such good news for us. Because it reminds us that Jesus came into a real world with real people who had real problems. We don't have to fake it. We don't have to pretend. Mary's posture of openness gave us the savior of the world. Joseph's commitment to the next step paved the way for the birth of Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that in this Christmas season, we have the chance to remember that Jesus was born into a real world. And God, if we're honest with ourselves today, we know there are things that we're hoping for. There are places that we are desperate for hope. Would you get through to our hearts the truth that you're not gonna compete with our efforts to control our life, but rather you're gonna wait. You'll just wait. So in this season and in those places where we need hope, we ask for the wisdom and the courage to open our lives to you. We pray for a posture of openness, for hands unfolded and open to all that you have for us, whatever it is. Lord, we wanna hear from you. And when we do, would you give us courage to simply take the next step? Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Jesus who was born into a world that desperately needed hope and brought it. Lord, would you be born into our lives this season, we ask in Jesus' name.